Revelation chapter 6 today, Revelation 6. Let's stand, shall we? We'll read this, beginning in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And the crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. There went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. When he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. See, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was death and hell, followed with him. And power was given unto him that them over the fourth part of the earth to kill a sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Lord, some things are so fantastic. Some things are so hard to grasp. Lord, we thank you for it today. Father, I pray for those who could not be with us today. Lord, I know that some are not well. They're not doing well. And Lord, we pray for them and pray that you would, Lord, help them this morning. But, Lord, we're here, and we do need a blessing. And, Lord, we do need to be encouraged. And, Lord, I pray that you would encourage us today. As we look around us and see, Lord, what's going on around us, we cannot help but believe that time is growing short. Father, I pray again for each person here. Again, you know the hearts of each one here. Lord, I pray that you'll meet the need of their heart. We pray for anyone who may be watching by TV today, Lord, again, for the need that they have. We pray, Lord, for the salvation of the souls of men. Lord, we pray for the salvation of the souls of men. Lord, help us to be doing what we can do in the time that we have left. Our time may be very limited. It may be shorter than what we can possibly imagine. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Again, I thank you for each one of the folks who are here. Bless, we pray in the few minutes that we have. We want to pray for America. And we pray for that tiny nation of Israel, Lord, today. Bless, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you may be seated. While you're being seated, let me say that on April the 3rd, now, there's a couple things coming up on March, I believe it's the 15th, that Brother Dewey Williams is going to be with us. And uh, Brother Dewey's been with us several times. He's a great guy. You'll be with us on that Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and I believe Wednesday. I believe that's what it is. I might be wrong on the dates. But anyway, on April the 3rd, April the 3rd, I keep asking her, and she keeps telling me that she's getting married. Uh, Bella's getting married on April the 3rd. Everybody is invited. It's a Friday morning. Uh, Friday morning. Um, you know, at 11 -ish, she doesn't know. She, she She's her sister, and she doesn't know, but I think it's around 11 o'clock. You know, it's kind of late in the morning. Like I say, if it doesn't work out, at least they didn't waste the whole day. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. She married that, that young fellow that comes with her, and so uh, sometimes he goes to another church up in Watertown. But you're invited to that. Now, there'll be a sign-up thing in the back. It's not up yet, but you are invited to come to that, and I hope that Hope that you will. So that's a big day, amen. That's a big day when you get married, amen. And so I hope that you will uh, come for her sake. Revelation chapter six. I I don't have too much problem. I don't, I really don't have very much problem. I have very little doubt of the fact that prophecy is always an interesting thing, and that people really like prophecy. Sometimes we wonder how it all will work out, but I have no doubt that it will all work out. 
Uh, the Bible says about Christ in his first coming that he would be of Nazareth, but yet he would be born in Bethlehem, yet he would be called out of Egypt. And we look back now and say, well, boy, we see how that all worked out. And while we don't understand everything that there is to know about prophecy, we can rest assured that it's all going to work out. We can rest assured with the fact that God is in control and that God knows exactly what's going on. Uh, that God's got a plan, God's got a program, and that plan and program is being worked out even as we are in this building today. God's program is being worked out. Now, the key verse, of course, we've said many times over the last 30-some years is Revelation chapter 1. I believe it's verse 19. It says, write the things which thou hast seen. Uh, write the things which are and the things which thou hast seen and the things which shall be hereafter. The book of Revelation is easily divided up into three different sections. The things which are chapters 2 and 3 when it talks about the church age. Uh, there are seven churches. Uh, seven is the number of completion. God created the world in seven days. Uh, on six days, seven day rest, seven day week. We know that uh, he marched around, is, they marched around Israel for seven days, six days. Uh, one time, then on the seventh day, seven times. And seven is the number of completion. And so there are seven churches. When this, the, at the end of the age, the seventh church will have been completed. Uh, the seven churches speak to seven different churches at the time that John wrote this. The seven churches speak to seven different types of churches that have been prevalent throughout the last 2,000 years. The seven churches speak about the seven kinds of churches that are around today. Chapter 4, and verse 1, there is a major shift in the book of Revelation. And when we read verse 1, as you note what it says there, uh, the Spirit, and after these things, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, a door which was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. And so there's a different shift in the book. The book changes from the things which are, which would be the church age, to the things which must be hereafter. And uh, so uh, there's a real change beginning there. Chapter 4 and 5, chapter 4 and 5 take place in heaven. Chapter 5 is where we first read about the seven-sealed book. And John says, and uh, who, it was asked, well, who is worthy to open the book? And, and no man was found to open the book. And John said, I wept much, because there was no man found worthy to open him. And they said unto them, weep not, weep not in chapter 5. Look where it says this. And one of the elders in verse 5 said, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Really, the book is a title deed to the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the world and all that dwell therein. Listen, this world belongs to God. Now, I know a lot of people have a different idea about that. If we wanted to spend time this morning, we'd talk about the lunacy of global warming and all the predictions that they have made that have failed to come to pass. Man, thank God for global warming. Amen. I mean, look at it. <clears throat> I think that they have determined that in the last 30 years, the temperature has varied three thousandths of one degree. That's a real telltale sign. Amen. But we're not going to talk about that today. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns the earth. It's his. It's his to do what he wants with. And then chapter 5 introduces us to the book with the seven seals. I want to say this, we're not going to get to it uh, this morning. The seventh seal, under the seventh seal, uh, we find the uh, seven trumpets. And then under the, uh, with the seventh trumpet, we'll find the opening of the seven vials. There are seven thunders that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, uh, but they really don't. The Bible says the writer was told not to write the things which he saw about the seven thunders. We don't know what it is. But in chapter 6, then, we find the opening, beginning of the opening, of the seven-sealed book. There are seven seals in this book. And in chapter 6, we begin in verse 1, uh, we read about the course, I believe, of what is going to happen. Now, as I said in Sunday school, you know, there are good people, and I mean this. 
There are good people who disagree about exactly what, what's going to happen. Uh, I, I think the Bible is, is fairly clear. Again, when we think about prophecy, when we think about the things that are going to happen, that have not happened, and if we, we, there are some things that we can dogmatically say, there are some other things say, well, this is what we believe the Bible teaches. And so I'm telling you what I believe the Bible teaches this morning. There are good people who would disagree with the preacher. As I said in Sunday school, they're going to find out one day that they are wrong. But, but thank God, you know, we, we have this idea and we, uh, 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 what, about what the Bible teaches. Now, chapter 4, verse 1. I'm not going to look back at it, but chapter 4, verse 1. Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. Now, the first voice, as I heard, was as a trumpet. Now, the book of Revelation, you know, people have said for years, nobody can really understand the book of Revelation. But then people say, well, nobody can really understand the Bible. I Seriously, I had a guy tell me one time, this guy went to church where I, I was the preacher at. Now, it wasn't this church. Um, because none of the Bible would ever say this, but, but I went to this, I was the preacher at this church in Texas, and this guy looked me straight in the face and said, unless God Almighty himself comes down and tells us what's in the Bible, nobody can understand the Bible. Well, how silly, really, think about that. How silly is that? God gave us a book that nobody has the faintest idea what it's all about. No, we can understand the Bible. So in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, and the first voice I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for the trumpet of the Lord, uh, no, the song says, for the trumpet of the Lord to sound times will be no more. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope for. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. With the trump of God. And so in chapter 4, verse 1, the first voice I heard as the word was a trumpet saying, come up hither, come up hither. I am convinced by, by Scripture and by the Holy Spirit that one of these days, one of these days, and I hope to show you in just a few minutes, that one of these days, and maybe even today, I don't know that it'll be today, nobody knows. But the Bible says this, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Jesus could come today. You need to be ready. Now, so in chapter 4, we're in heaven. In chapter 5, we're in heaven. But now chapter 6 comes back to the earth. And the six, the seven seals of what is going to happen takes place. Chapter 4, Jesus comes for the church. Now, you know, I know that people disagree. My brother, God bless him. I love my brother. He's a good guy. One of, all my brothers are good guys. Some of them are just kookier than others. But this one is not real bad. I mean, he's pretty good. I, I, I love the guy. He's a tremendous guy. He's, he's really sold out kind of guy, really, for, for the Lord. And, uh, but he doesn't believe that chapter 4, verse 1 is talking about Jesus coming for the church. Um, there are so many verses. We simply don't have time to go into it. But I believe that chapter 4, verse 1 speaks about Jesus coming for the church. Now, my brother believes that Jesus will come for the church in the middle of the, of the tribulation period. Uh, I have others who believe that Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation period and take the church home. We're not talking about the rapture today. Somebody says, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. You're absolutely correct. The word trinity is not in the Bible. You're absolutely correct. But the idea, the, the, the teaching of the trinity is in the Bible. And the Bible says this, that uh, so we shall be caught up together. What does the word rapture mean? It means be caught up. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we shall be caught up together with the Lord. We're going to be caught up. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise, and then we which are alive and remain. Some people question, and I, and I would also this, when Jesus comes for the church, when he comes for the church, will the great tribulation begin immediately? Will the great tribulation period begin immediately? The Bible is not really clear about that. Some would say, well, it will begin almost immediately. Can you stop and think about this? Stop and think about this for a moment. It, when Jesus comes, not if he comes. Folks, this is not a question of if Jesus is coming again. 
the, the, the truth is that Jesus will come again. When Jesus comes and takes all the Christians out, I mean, he takes them all out. And there are countless scores of, of scores and hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. May we even say millions of people have been saved and born again and washed in the blood of the Lamb that are going to be caught out and we are going to go up to heaven with him. When that happens, there's going to be a, there's going to be a problem down here. There's going to be a lot of people missing. I've read this. I don't know whether it's true or not. I mean, you can read almost anything. The New York Times already has the headline printed, Millions Missing. And that may be true. It may not be true. I don't know. You read all kinds of things. I, I've read this, that, and I've heard this, that they are cutting the stones uh, for the new temple in Indiana. Why would they cut stones for the temple in Indiana when they've got all kinds of rocks over in Israel? I mean, you can read almost anything. So we're back in chapter 6 and verse 1. What is going to happen? What will happen? What will happen? Well, after the church is taken out, and as you read chapters 2 and 3, you find the word church mentioned over and over and over and over. After chapter 3, the church is not mentioned any longer. Something happened to the church. church is gone, taken out. You don't find it mentioned any longer after that. The great tribulation at some point, the great tribulation at some point, will begin, whether it will begin immediately after the church is taken out, whether it be a period of months, whether it be a period of, of several years. Um, the Bible is not clear. But in chapter 6, beginning in chapter 6 of Revelation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the sentence. In chapters 2 and 3, we're here on the earth. Chapter 4 and 5, we're in heaven. Chapter 6, we come back to the earth as you read through the book. Beginning in chapter 6, we find, the, we find given in some detail and some not so detail about what is going to happen during the great tribulation period here on this earth. Chapter 6 and verse 1. And I saw, and I saw when the Lamb, now you'll notice in chapter 5 he's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Here in chapter 6, verse 1, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Thunder! Usually before the storm gets here, you hear thunder. So when we say, well, uh, Jesus said, uh, this is the beginning of sorrows in Matthew chapter 24. I heard, as it were, thunder, that, that the storm is coming. There is a storm coming. And we look around the world today. I mean, we, you just look around the world and all that is going on in the world today. I mean, we live in a wicked, ungodly world. I, this ISIS outfit over there in uh, uh, ISIS, the Islamic State in Syria, um, uh, that's what it is. And, and uh, there, are, there are all kinds of names we could call those guys. but we dare not call them Islamic terrorists. But that's exactly what they are. It's not the Methodists that are doing this. It's not the Catholics. It's not the Presbyterians. It's not the Baptists. It's the Islamics. I saw on the news this morning. Uh, you may remember, it was over in Indonesia, that they, they uh, killed 60-some people in a mall in uh, Indonesia, big mall. Now, now the big threat is the Mall of America in, in Minnesota. They've said they're going to attack the Mall of America in Minnesota. We live, we live in a very troublesome world. I heard thunder. I hear the thunder in the distance. Storm's coming. It's a great storm. Jump back quickly. Hold your place right there, because we'll be back. Look back at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. About this coming storm, Matthew 24 and verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation. Verse 21, Matthew 24. Got it? For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to that time and nor ever shall be. Now, that's quite a statement when you think about that. 
He said, there is a time of trouble coming such as never was since the beginning of the world. You think about all the way back to Adam and Eve. You think about all the wars. You think about all the butchering and the slaughter and the murder and the maim and the killing. You think about all that that has happened in the last 6,000 <coughs> years. And Jesus makes a statement like this in verse 21. For then shall there be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. I mean, brother, that's quite a statement. You're talking about chaos here on the earth. Now, there, that time is coming. I mean, you think back to World War II. I, I, you know, some of you were around during World War II. I remember dear Mrs. Carpenter, uh, our good friend lived over in Glenfield. She, she told me one time, she remembered, she was just a little girl. She was a little girl. Uh, she was a little girl, she said, on, on December 7th, 1941. She said, December 7th, 1941, she said, I'll never forget that. She said, everybody went to church and prayed. Everybody was praying, and, and, or World War II, I'm sorry. And whether or not, now we denied that we knew anything about it, but you think of the concentration camps that Adolf Hitler ran and the six million Jewish people. I know, I know, you say, wait a minute, preacher. Uh, there are people, they say, that's all a myth. That was not a myth. That was true. Six million Jews killed. That didn't count the Poles and the Czechs. That didn't count the Russians. That didn't count the millions of people that were butchered and slaughtered. And we think of the German concentration camps and say, well, we don't ever want that to happen again. We don't ever want to have that happen again. You, some of you may have read, if you haven't, you ought to read the diary of Anne Frank. She was a Jewish girl that was hid in an attic um, during World War II and eventually some, with her family and, and somebody turned them in. And she was sent to a concentration camp and she and her, and her sister and her mother died there. They died of typhus, they had typhus epidemic. And she died of it, but you read her diary of what happened, and, and you think of all the little girls that were killed and butchered in um, World War II at the concentration. Well, we don't ever want that to happen again. We don't ever want that to happen again. But I'm telling you, it's happening today. Right now it's happening. Little girls begging and screaming and crying. Why don't you do something about that, Mr. President? Oh, well, we don't want to offend anybody. I'm telling you, as bad as it is, there's a time coming such as never was like that. We hear the thunder in the distance. Jesus said a time of trouble. Look at Daniel. Hold your, you still got Revelation because we're going right back there. Look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, beginning in verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand. Up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of, it, of thy people, which is Israel, all right? And then shall be a time of trouble. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time. Look, there's a time of trouble coming. Jesus said such as never was since the beginning of the world. Here, here uh, Daniel says that a time of trouble, as you turn back to Revelation 6, there's a time of trouble coming. We can hear the thunder. Chapter 6 and verse 1 said, and I heard as it were thunder. Thunder indicates that a storm is coming. There is a storm coming. And one of the four beasts saying, and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Come and see. Come and look. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right, here's the first seal. First John chapter 2 and verse 18 tells us this, that, uh, and this is the only place in the Bible that this word is used. Hereby we know that many antichrists have come. The only time in the Bible the word antichrist is used is there in First John chapter 2 and verse 18. And I think that we can from Scripture safely assume that there have been many antichrists that have appeared on the scene over the years. Some have, some have put forth the idea that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist, but it wasn't God's timing. 
And so uh, he wasn't it. I, I, I know that. I know this. I know this. That there were people who preached sermons when uh, 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 the president was elected. Is he the Antichrist? Is he the Antichrist? No. Now, there are some things about this guy, about the Antichrist, that uh, look in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis 49. Will we know who this Antichrist is? Now, uh, as you turn to Genesis 49, let me just say that there is an Antichrist going to come on the scene. Anti means against. The Antichrist is against everything Christ is for. Uh, Genesis and verse and chapter 49. The Antichrist will be against everything that God is for. He is against it. Antichrist, that, that little term there. Now, there are several things about this Antichrist that we'll see. Somebody says, well, we know who the Antichrist is uh, before Jesus comes. Uh, lots of people come up with numerical ideas. Uh, you may remember me saying this, that years ago, Henry Kissinger, who was part Jewish, uh, and he uh, talks like uh, this. And, uh, and, you know, he said, well, Antichrist, because they, somebody took the alphabet and they, they gave the number, they gave the letter A the number 6, and they gave the letter B, 12, and the letter C, 18, the letter D, 24, all the way through the alphabet. Then they took Kissinger's name, added up all the letters in his name, and it came out to 666. And somebody said, well, there, Kissinger is the Antichrist. Kissinger wasn't the Antichrist. He isn't the Antichrist. Somebody said, well, will we know anything about the Antichrist? In Genesis chapter 49 and about verse 16, when Jacob is is blessing his children. He says this in verse uh, 16, Genesis 49, verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now, I think that it's important to note that in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14, when it lists the 12 tribes of Israel, Dan is not mentioned. Here in verse 16, it says, Dan shall judge. Dan shall be a serpent. Well, who's that old serpent? Well, that's the devil. Dan shall be a serpent. Um, lost some place. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backwards. Many believe that this is the idea that Dan, that Dan, the Antichrist will come out of the tribe of Dan. Look over Gen or Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Will we know who the Antichrist is? Will we know who the Antichrist is? Now, I want to say some more things from chapter 6 and verse 1 of Revelation just a minute about this guy. But in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, here's a great prophecy. Now, some have suggested that the Antichrist will be at least part Jewish. I mean, I don't have any problem with that. Verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall... Uh, destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof. Oh, wait a minute. In 70 AD, who destroyed the temple? Well, that was the Roman Empire. So some, most people believe this, that the Antichrist will come out of the old Roman Empire and be Jewish. They so, say, well, how can that possibly be? Well, as I said before, uh, the, the, the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem, of the city of Nazareth, and out of Egypt. You say, well, how did that work out? Well, it worked out just fine. And so the Antichrist will probably, will probably partially Jewish, come out of the Roman Empire. He may even come out of Syria. Um, and you say, well, how can all that work out, preacher? Well, I don't know. But I do know that God will work everything out. He's worked everything out so far. Jump back to John chapter 5. Will the Jewish people accept this person? John chapter 5. Note what it says here. John 5 and verse 43. John 5, verse 43. Let me get to chapter 5. It says this. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive, and ye receive me not. Now, note what it says. If another shall come and his own name, him he will receive. Seems to be a verse that indicates that the Jewish people will receive the Antichrist as possibly the Messiah. 
Because as you know now, the Jews do not believe that the Messiah has come. They do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Jump back to chapter 6. Some other things about the Antichrist. Chapter 6. We're opening the first seal. I hear the sound of thunder. Will we know who the Antichrist is? Probably not. The Bible makes it very clear in 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians. I'll get it right. And chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And when he that led us shall be taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed. I'm not sure that we will know who the Antichrist is. We may have some idea. We may have some inclination. Uh, the New Agers, the New Agers, the New Agers say that the Antichrist is alive, that he, he's alive in London right now. Um, and I've heard my brother, who's not a big conspiracy guy, even mention the guy's name. I know the guy's name. But anyway, they say he's alive in London right now. He may be. I don't know. Now, chapter 6, verse 2. And I saw, remember, thunder, thunder in the distance. We hear thunder. And I beheld a white horse. White horse shows conquering. Now, somebody says, well, is this Jesus? No, Jesus comes on a white horse in Revelation chapter 19. He comes in Revelation chapter 19. And when he comes, the war will be over. He'll speak, and he'll destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet and cast them in the devil. All those guys are going to be thrown in the lake of fire. This is not Revelation chapter 19. Here we see this guy riding a white horse, which is he's conquering. He goes forth to conquer. And he had a white, and he had a bow, no arrows. He has no arrows, which indicates that if you'll read the next verse, and a crown was given unto him. It was given to him. He didn't have to fight for it. He did not have to cause a war. Listen, we live in such trouble sometimes now, and we do. We see all the fighting that's going on all around the world. Uh, over in the Middle East, terrible over there. Uh, the Iranians. <coughs> the Iranians, which the president is, is, pardon me, the president is hell-bent on getting some kind of a nuclear deal with the Iranians, even if it means we've got to give up everything, uh, uh, but the kitchen sink. You do know the, who the Iranians' biggest backer are. Magog, Gog, or as we know it today, Russia. The Iran look, the Iranians are behind most of the problems going on over there today. The Iranians want a nuclear weapon so they can destroy Israel. And you know what? Here's my thing, and I've said this. The liberals would love that because then it would prove the Bible to be not true. I, I, just, I, I want to say this quickly. I'm for Israel. I'm for that. And God said that he would bless any nation that was for Israel. We have a, I don't care how I say this, but we have, a, we have an administration that is anti-Semitic. That's what they are. I mean, they, they are. So I, my, 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 my old dad said, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, and rain rolls off the back like a duck, it's probably a duck. If somebody says, well, oh, no, 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 no. This, this has been the most anti-Semitic administration that we may have ever seen in American history. Now this Antichrist will come upon the scene. Trouble, oh, there's going to be a time for all oh, trouble, trouble, trouble. He's going to come without a bow. He's not going to have any arrows. He's not going to fire a shot. And they're going to give him a crown because the guy is going to appear on the scene. And the Bible says this in the book of Daniel. He shall speak great swelling words. This guy is going to appear on the scene. And people are going to marvel at him. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. And it said, and I, and I saw, look at Revelation 13. Better look at it. We're right there. I want to read it the right way. And verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. The sea is a picture of mankind. I stood upon the sand of the sea and a beast and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And it tells us what the beast was like. And I saw one of his heads, verse 3, as it were wounded to death. So I said, do you think, pre preacher, do you think that the Antichrist is going to be somebody to come back from the dead? We don't know. We, we don't know. What, what exactly the meaning of the verse? It says, I, I saw that where one of his heads wounded unto death. We're not sure about it, possibly. 
you stop and think about it. You stop and think about this. One of a, and time has somewhat dulled the memory of, of what John F. Kennedy, who he really was. He was a whole lot more conservative. Ah, we're not going there. But anyway, uh, you stop and think for just a moment. When I was in college, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories going around about what really happened uh, on November 22, 1963. Uh, one of, my, one, of, one of my teachers was in the John Birch Society. Now, I, I, I don't care what you may think about the John Birch Society today, but John Birch was a godly, God-fearing missionary that was killed by the communist Chinese in, in China. But, but Dr. Crane said that Kennedy really didn't die that day, that the coffin was like six inches shorter than he was, and that... There was a secret island uh, where uh, Mrs. Onassis lived and that Kennedy was really alive. Nah, I don't think so. Well, you stop and think about that for a minute. When you look at the Zapruder film, the fatal shot literally blew Kennedy's side of his head off. You look at it. I mean, you look at it and saw, I mean, it's gory. But they literally blew the side of his head off. Now you think about this for a minute. Suppose there was somebody like that that had been wounded in the head and came back to, and was revived. All the world's going to wonder at this guy. Now, whether or not there's somebody who's been fatally wounded and, and is revived or not, we can't say. But I'm just asking you to consider that for a moment if, if, they, if they did. Now, this guy has, has been given, he's been given, because he appears on the scene and all the chaos is in the world, all the chaos that is in the world, here's somebody appears on the scene and says, wow, who is like under the beast? There's nobody like this guy. He'll be a good-looking, suave guy. The Bible says he'll not regard the God of his fathers, which again leads us to believe that he is at least partially Jewish. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, he'll be a suave, smooth-talking uh, kind of guy. And people say, wow, who is like this guy? Nobody's ever been like this guy. He's a tremendous guy. All the problems that we see in the world, all the wars and the rumors of wars and nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and this guy appears on the scene and says, I've got a solution to the problem. And the Jews say, wow. The Jews evidently are going to follow him. And the world will accept this solution. And it says in Revelation, he has ten crowns, seven heads, ten crowns. Again, we're looking at what many believe to be the revived Roman Empire that will come out of there. But now notice this also. The crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering. Now, he did not go forth with war. He's a smooth talker, and all the world's going to wonder after him. And people are finally, remember the Antichrist, is against Christ. When Jesus comes again and sets up his kingdom on this earth, there's going to be everlasting peace, everlasting righteousness, everlasting uh, joy, everlasting prosperity, everlasting everything because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to come and he's going to rule and reign. But the Antichrist is against Christ, everything that there is. When the Antichrist appears on the scene, people say, wow, who is like this guy? We've got peace and prosperity. Uh, uh, a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And for three and a half years, it's going to look like, wow, heaven has come to earth. Chapter two, or chapter 6 and verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, a, a, a victor's horse. There set on him a bow, no arrows, and he went forth to conquer. A crown, thou crown him. See, this is it. This is the guy. This is the, this is the Messiah. He's the Antichrist. But the world will wonder after him. And say, who is like unto the beast? There isn't anybody like him. But something happens. Something drastic, something terrible happens. In verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, and I heard the second beast say, he said, well, who are the beasts here? Well, in chapter 4, if you read, there are four beasts there. Um, and they're opening, and the second beast said, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And 
power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Boy, everything is really going along hunky-dory. The Antichrist is here. There's peace, prosperity in the world. But in the middle, because the Bible makes it clear the rev that the tribulation period is divided in two halves, the first half, second half, which would make sense, but the first half, the second half, the first half will be somewhat. And, and I'll just pause here and say this. This is my brother's reasoning for thinking the rapture will not occur until the middle of the tribulation because the first half of the tribulation will be a time of peace and prosperity. There, 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 there won't be. And so he, my brother believes the church will go through the first three and a half years of the tribulation and that at the middle, but we, we don't have time to go into all that this morning. But peace and prosperity. But then the second seal is open. All these guys that run around mocking Christ and mocking the Bible and mocking Christians, they're in for a real surprise one day. Did you ever play chess? Now, I never played chess. I don't even like playing checkers. I always get beat at checkers. Chess is just not my game either. Uh, the pawn can move this way and the rook can move this way and the queen this way and the king this way, blah, 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 blah. But if you're going to learn to play chess, you've got to play against somebody who is better than you. And what they'll do is they'll give you just enough rope to hang yourself till you get to the end of the game, and then they'll say, checkmate, and they got you. God's given the world just enough rope to hang themselves. Men think they're so smart. They're, the humanist idea is, well, we got ourselves in this problem. We'll have to get ourselves out. I, I say again, there is no solution but God. He, he, he is the only solution to the problem. Now, in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, in the middle of it, the second seal will be open. Now, at first, he goes forth to conquer with no arrows, Smooth-talking guy. And they give him. They willingly. He does, you'll note what it says in verse 2. And a crown was given unto him. He didn't take it. It was given to it. Here. You have the answer to the problems. Here. You have the solution to the problems. We'll let you be the ruler. In the middle of it. In a red, a red horse. Notice, and power was given unto him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. All the first three and a half years was peaceful. Now peace is the disintegrated. And you'll note what it says there in verse 3. Uh, or, yeah, verse 4, I'm sorry. And that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. They should kill one another. They're going to kill one another. You think we live in bad times. Remember what Jesus said now in Matthew 24 and verse 21. Uh, There's a time coming such as never was. People are going to be slaughtered. They're going to be murdering each other. Again, go back to Matthew 24. Don't bother, but Matthew 24 it says, kingdom shall rise against kingdom. That, that would be a, a, a civil war. Kingdom against kingdom. Civil war. We see that in Syria today. Civil war. We see it in, in Iraq today. Uh, there's a civil war going on in Iraq. Afghanistan. Civil war going on over there. Uh, kingdom against kingdom. Nation against nation. That's Iran trying to take over the entire Middle East. Uh, that's Iran saying, we'll destroy Israel. Uh, that's Iran we're giving out uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and, and all these others, uh, where nation will, will fight against nation. Peace will be taken from the earth. Be wholesale slaughter time. When the second seal is open. First seal, all oh, great peace, all oh, prosperity. Everybody's happy. But God has given people just in the world, God has given the world just enough rope to hang itself. The world follows after the Antichrist, which is against Christ, and they're following him. Remember now, thunder. We hear the thunder in the distance. The storm is coming. We hear the thunder. The storm is coming. 
Now notice verse 5, because we're going to run out of time. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld, and let me read that again. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. See thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So now peace is taken from the earth. First there's real peace and prosperity. Now peace is taken from the earth when the red seal is open. And the, red or the second seal is open and the red horse goes out. And power is given to the red horse rider, the red rider to take peace from the earth. They're now killing themselves. And after killing themselves, and there are wars and rumors of wars and nation against the nation and kingdom against kingdom, and they're butchering and slaughtering each other. Well, the natural thing to follow is this, famine. So in verse 5 and 6, when the third seal is opened and the uh, black rider uh, on that horse goes out, and it says a pair of balances in our uh, voice saying a, a measure of wheat for a penny. The measure is about a liter. That's how much it was, a liter. And it was a penny was the, the, the Roman denarius, which was what, again, a day's wages uh, uh, in that time. A penny, a denarius, it's not like our penny, a copper penny. Now, oh boy, what's that? But in those days, it was a day's wages. You remember in Matthew chapter, I believe it's chapter 20, 20. I know it was that he gave every man a penny for his day's work. That was a day's wages. You could live on a penny. A day's wage today, people make anywhere from 80 uh, to 120 to uh, $200. I mean, some people, you look at their houses, you want to knock on the door and say, what do you do for a living that you could afford a house like this? But we're, we'll, we'll just say this, that $100, $100, $100. Now, I know most people make more than that, but, but $100 a day will buy you one liter of wheat. That, that's all, I mean, it's all you can do to keep body and soul together because now famine is, while there is no food, there's, we live in a world of shortages today. We, we, my, my brother, my brother, my one brother, I love, my, I love all my brothers, some are kookier than others. My one brother, man, he has got a war against Monsanto. Because Monsanto makes all these genetically mutated kind of things that we eat. We wonder why there's so much cancer in the world. But uh, we live in a world of, of famine. We live in a world where people don't have enough to eat. Now, not, not true in America. It's not true in America. More people are on food stamps now than ever been. But, but there is going to come a time. Now, listen. Now, now here's how the scenario is played out. There's a man of peace that appears. They say, who is like unto the beast? We'll give him, we'll give him, we'll give him whatever he wants. In the middle of it, in the middle of it, he is going to turn on Israel. Now remember we read in John chapter 5 and verse 43, I think it was, that, that they will receive the Antichrist. The Jews will receive the Antichrist. They say, boy, this guy is the answer to our problems. But in the middle of the Great Tribulation, he was going to turn on Israel. And he's going to set himself up as God in the temple. The second seal now, peace is taken from the earth. War breaks out all over the earth. They slaughter one another. It's, it's, it's just horrible. It's horrific. And because war breaks out, nobody can plan anything. One of the things about the Civil War that devastated the South was that there's never any time for planning and harvesting during the war. It's devastation. When the third seal is open and the black horse comes out, it'll take it all you can make every single day to buy one liter. Now it says three measures of barley. Barley, of course, is a coarser kind of a, a uh, uh, grain. And you get a little more of that for a day's wages. It says, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Oil and wine is what rich people have. What's going to happen is that the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer and it's just going to be horrible. Now the fourth seal. The Antichrist has appeared on the scene. Peace and prosperity has broken out. But God has now given them enough rope. They've hung themselves. And war now breaks out. After war, there is famine. 
But then notice in verse 7. And when they opened the fifth, the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat thereon was Death. Capital D. Not little d. It was not, not just death, but death. That was the, right, the pale horse rider. His name is Death and Hell. We, we sometimes his name was Death and Hell. No, that's not what happened. His name was Death and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them that over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death with, and with the beast of the field. Now you stop now. I think somebody mentioned there's about 7 billion people in the world closing therein. Now, we know from verse 2 that they butcher and slaughter themselves, so how many are killed there, we don't know. But here we read that a fourth part of the people in the world, we'll just say 8 billion people, 2 billion people are killed. What are they going to do with 2 billion dead bodies? Where are they going to put them? Now note it. And death. Because when you read in verse 8, it tells us to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death. Little d there. Little d there. But at the beginning of the verse, and death. Death follows. There's a time coming such as never was. So, see, here's the thing about verse 8. Death kills the body. Hell kills the soul. Death and hell. What is that? Um, we got to quit. Death and hell. See, where, what about people who are saved? What about people who are saved? We call those people tribulation saints. What will happen to them is another time, another sermon. But I said this a little while ago, that God has given people in the world just enough rope to hang themselves and they have. And death now follows. After the famine, death follows, and hell follows right after them. People who are not saved, people who are lost. Somebody says, you're just trying to scare me. I hope so. I mean that. Death and hell follow. After the time of peace, war breaks out. After war, then comes famine and a dearth upon the whole earth. And after that, comes death and hell and whosoever was not found written in the book of life. John says in verse 1 that it was as the noise of thunder. I believe I can hear the thunder. The storm's just about to roll in. It's just about. Death and hell will follow. Preacher, you're trying to scare me. No, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to get us to see that, man, judgment is coming. There's one thing about him being the Lamb of God. But when he comes, he's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And judgment will follow. And death and hell will follow. May I ask you this morning? And you think about it. You think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Where will you be? Ten seconds after death, heaven or hell. Nobody wants to go to, you'll forgive me for saying this, but it's true. Nobody wants to go to that God-awful place called hell. At least most people don't. I've met some people say, well, but they have no idea what they're talking about. You don't want to go there. If you're watching us today, you don't want to go there. If you're here today, you don't want to go there. I'm telling you that there is trouble coming. I can hear the thunder. Oh, it, it may not rain this week. It may not rain next week or next month. It may not even rain next year. But I'm telling you, when you look at the situation in the world, I can hear the thunder. It's not too far off. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Our time's up. Father, we thank you again today. Lord, when we look at this situation in the world and look at everything that's happening and going on, we just can't help but think that, boy, time is so short. It's of the essence. If 
we're going to see people saved, we better see them saved quickly. If we're going to reach anybody with the gospel, we better reach them quickly. Lord, time is short. Father, we, I pray today for folks who may have been watching, folks who may watch. I pray for the people who are in this room. Lord, I pray that everyone knows for sure that heaven's their home. Lord, if they don't, if they do not know for sure that heaven's their home. Lord, we're reminded that, that salvation is a free gift. It's for everybody and anybody. Lord, if they'll call whosoever. Lord, maybe there's somebody today who has never called upon the name of the Lord, never repented, never changed their mind about who they are and what they are and who Jesus is and how to get to heaven. Lord, I pray today will be that day. Help folks to realize that if they just call, that they'll call in faith. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, but the gift of God. Lord, we thank you that salvation is not a works thing, but it's a free gift. Lord, you make that clear. It's a free gift in the Romans, Lord. But we're thankful for that. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Nobody looking. Nobody is looking. Nobody is looking. Nobody. If you died today, do you know for sure that you'd go to heaven? Do you know that? Man, I think the desire of everyone's heart is, man, I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. If you don't know for sure, you'd go to heaven. I'd just like to pray for you. That's all. Again, we don't try to embarrass anybody, and I wouldn't embarrass you for the life of me. But if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, i just like to pray for you, that's all. Would you slip your hand up? I'll see it. Nobody's looking. Our TV cameras are off. Nobody's looking. Is there anyone today say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven when I die, and I don't want to be left here when the Antichrist appears on the scene. Preacher, would you please pray for me before you close today? Pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. If you'll slip your hand up, I'm looking. If you slip your hand up, I'll certainly pray for you. Do you know for sure that heaven's yours? Do you know that? Not do you hope it, not do you guess, not do you think, but do you know? Father, I don't see any hands. So, Lord, I pray for each one of us. Lord, help us do what we can do while we have time to do it. Because there is a day coming, there is a night coming when no man shall work. So, Lord, what we're going to do for you, help us to do quickly. Because, Jesus, you said you're coming quickly. Lord, I, I think of, Lord, the Good Samaritan. You gave enough for two days. You've been gone for two days. The wedding feast at Cana was three days. On the third day was the, was the wedding. Two days went by. The third day was that great wedding feast day. Lord, we look at that. Two days have gone by. The time when Jesus is going to rule and reign, that thousand years, that one day is about to occur. Lord Jesus, you must be close. Lord, help us do what we ought to do, what we can do, what we should do. Help the preacher do that. Again, we thank you for this good day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here one more time. Boy, Lord, time went by really quickly today. But Father, I thank you for the opportunity one more time to be back here to be the preacher. Lord, I thank you that you allowed me to be here, Lord, today. Now bless us, we ask, as we go our way. Bring us back tonight, Lord, that we can fellowship and rejoice together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.